Hi friends, I'm Jill Morricone. I can't believe we're on lesson number 13. We've come all the way to the end of this journey through God's mission, my mission. It's been a practical study, a powerful study, and I think very authentic as I've learned so much from each one of our family week by week. We're on lesson number 13, the end of God's mission, looking at the book of Revelation. I want to introduce your family and my family at the table here to my left, Pastor John. It's been a good study hasn't it? Yes, it has been, and I'm excited about the one that I've been given the opportunity to present, the Three Angels Messages. Yay, Amen. Yes. absolutely. In the middle, Ryan Day. Amen, I have the opportunity to present Tuesday's lesson, The Final Crisis. Ooh, mm -hmm. Powerful, Pastor James Rafferty. I have Wednesday's lesson, and that is entitled Success, Success in Mission. Amen, last but not le least, my sister in Jesus, Shelley Quinn. Oh, I'm excited because Thursday's lesson is mission complete. Amen. I, like that. I just want to say for each one of you, what a joy it is to minister together. What a joy it is to work together here at 3ABN and to learn from each one of you as you share. So thank you for your diligence to study, um, to show yourself approved unto God and for sharing from your heart. Amen. And what a joy it is to have you as part of our 3ABN family. Thank you for joining us week by week. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer before we go any further. And Ryan, would you pray for us? Sure, absolutely. Father in heaven, it's been such a, just a wonderful privilege and honor to represent you over these last few weeks, uh, months together, Lord, as we've studied your mission. Your mission is our mission, and we know that, and we're so thrilled mm. to be able to present that truth and to learn more. So, Father, pour out your spirit upon yes. this panel, uh, upon all those viewers that are watching, Lord. May we all grow and learn together, and may we all share in your heart for mission, mm -hmm. we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 This week, the end of God's mission. We explore the mission concept in the book of Revelation. Revelation is a missionary book focused on a missionary God who is calling us to be a missionary church. We are called to proclaim present truth to the world until everyone has made their choice, either for or against God. Danny Shelton always says, we read the back of the book and it says what? We win. Mm -hmm. But you know what? We don't truly win unless we've brought everyone that we could to accept Jesus, unless we have witnessed and done everything within our power to share the mission of Jesus with a lost and dying world. Mm -hmm. We see the cosmic conflict, this great controversy theme run throughout the book of Revelation, this battle between Christ and Satan. It began in heaven and then was carried out in this earth as we see in Revelation chapter 12. We see that Christ won the victory at the cross. Mm -hmm. Jesus came to reconcile the world back to God. Our mission in this great controversy is to share the gospel and to encourage other people to make a choice for God. We see that in Revelation chapter 14 in the three angels messages mm -hmm. that Pastor John is going to cover. And then finally, we see Revelation 21 and 22 that it will be over one day. Final destruction of sin and sinners. The recreation, new heavens and a new earth Amen. What a glorious day that will be. Here's a quote from Patriarchs and Prophets 342. The great plan of redemption results in fully bringing back the world into God's favor. All that was lost by sin is restored. Not only man, but the earth is redeemed to be the eternal abode of the obedient. For 6,000 years, Satan has struggled to maintain possession of the earth. Now God's original purpose in its creation is accomplished. The saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Our memory text is 2 Peter 3, 11 and 12. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? On Sundays, we look at Revelation, God's last day mission. And the passage I have is Revelation 1, verses 1 through 7. So you can turn there with me. Revelation 1, verses 1 through 7. We're going to look at God's last day mission from these seven verses. 
Now, we referenced many weeks ago that a story is never complete until the five W's are addressed. Who, what, where, when, why, how. Well, five W's and then a six how. We're going to look at these six elements of mission from Revelation 1, verses 1 through 7. So first, who? Who is the mission from? We're getting the answer from these seven verses. Who is the mission from? We're in Revelation 1, verses 4 and 5. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. So who is the mission from? God the Father, who is and was and is to come. God the Son, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. God the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits who are before the throne. God himself, set forth the mission. As Pastor James talked in the very first lesson, I think it was, that God was the first missionary. Mm -hmm. God himself set forth that mission. Second Peter uh, 3, 9, I was gonna say 2, 9, Second Peter 3, 9. God is not willing that any should perish, but mm -hmm. that all should come to repentance. Right. So the mission is from the Godhead, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Who is the mission to? We're in Revelation 1, verse 1. Revelation 1, 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. The word servants, doulos, a slave. A bond slave in the New Testament is used with the highest of dignity. We think a slave is not a good thing, but it's used with the highest dignity, namely of believers who willingly live under Christ's authority as his devoted followers. Who is the mission to? It's to us. It is to the church, that mission we are entrusted with, that we can share the gospel, the reconciling ministry, the gospel with the entire world. Mm -hmm. Now what, what is the mission? For that, we're going to Revelation 1, the second half of verse 5 and then verse 6. Revelation 1, 5 and 6. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Mm -hmm. There's a twofold mission in this passage that I see. The first, we're washed from our sins in his blood. Forgiveness and cleansing from sin. Mm -hmm. God came, Jesus came, the cross to reconcile us back to the Father. You and I could experience forgiveness, washing from those sins. The second half is restoration of the dominion that was lost when we sinned. We see this because he made us, will make us kings and priests. The lesson says this, the focus of God's mission is not simply to drag perishing people to safety. It's not just to wash us uh, with his blood. It's not just to forgive us and to save us. God's salvation offers a new and honorable status because God's image is restored in us. Hallelujah. God wants to completely reconcile us back to the Father, make us again and a perfect representation of the image of Jesus and make us kings and priests to his God and Father. Where? Where is the mission conveyed? For that, we're in Revelation 1, verse 4. Revelation 1, 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace to you and peace. The initial mission, of course, is to Asia Minor, to the churches that John is writing to. But if you look at Revelation 14, I know I'm trying to take everything from these seven verses, but if you look at Revelation 14, the mission is to the whole world, is it not? Mm -hmm. Every tribe and tongue and nation and people to the entire world. That's right. When? When is the mission to be accomplished? For that, we see Revelation 1-7. This is, I would say, the first fulfillment of the mission. And then, of course, you go to the rest of Revelation, you see the final fulfillment of the mission. Revelation 1-7, behold, he's coming with clouds. Every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. The mission 
will be, I would say, the first installment of the completion will be completed when Jesus returns the second time. Right. And there will be that end of sin and suffering and the saints will spend a thousand years with him in eternity. Now we know the mission is not fully completed till the final eradication of sin and the recreation of this earth, which we see towards the end of the book of Revelation. What about why? Why did God engage in this mission? For that, we're going to Revelation 1, verse 5. Let's start with the second half of verse 5, and then we're going to do the first half. So we're reading verse 5 out of order. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Why does he proclaim the mission? Why does he seek to save us? It's love. That's the motivation for mission. That's why God engaged in the mission, because he loved you and I. Revelation 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love for us. And that while we were yet still, even now sinners, Christ died Romans. for us. Romans 5, 8. Thank you. Romans 5, 8. Thank you. Then the second part of why he engages in the mission is actually in the first part of verse 5. Revelation 1, 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Why does he engage in mission? Because he's the owner. Because ownership. Jesus possesses the legal ownership of this planet. He got the victory over the devil and death at the cross. Amen. We know initially he's the owner because he created us in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But he's also the owner because he can recreate, he died for us and bought us back and can recreate in us the image of Jesus. And finally, the last is how. How is the mission accomplished? For that, we look at Revelation 1, verse 3. Blessed is he who reads. Let's stop right there. How is the mission accomplished? Through writing. The written Word of God, written tracts, written pamphlets, written dissemination of the Word, of the Gospel, of the truth. Every time you pass out a tract, you are helping to accomplish the mission. Every time you share the Word somehow through writing, you are helping to accomplish the mission. But it doesn't stop there. To those who hear the words of this prophecy, the Gospel, how is it communicated? Through the spoken Word. This is through television, like 3ABN or radio. This is through pastors preaching in the pulpit. This is through private discussions. You don't have to be a pastor and preach. It can be presented through private discussions. That's right. The God uses your mouth to share with your neighbors and those in your community. But it doesn't stop there. What's the third thing? The third blessing. And keep those things which are written in it. Mm -hmm. All will have the choice to accept Jesus or not. I call this simply free will. We have a choice to be obedient. Mm -hmm. We have a choice to walk in obedience. We have That's a choice right. to accept. You have a choice to accept the things you've heard mm -hmm. here on 3ABN or other places. You have a choice to listen, to internalize, and then to accept, and then to become involved in this incredible mission of saving souls for Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jill. Always exciting, always on point. And how exciting it is. December 25th, Christmas Day. What a message. The three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14. You know, the book of Revelation gives us a powerful graphical depiction of how the mission of God is going to end. Mm -hmm. It's probably one of the most dramatic pictures drawn in the Bible. It takes us down to the, to the culmination, to the final steps. And how do we know that we're living in that time where Revelation is letting us know that the gospel is going to triumph victoriously? Let's go to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12. This is the dividing line between will it and yes, it will. <laughs> Revelation 12 and verse 12. Therefore, you know, therefore is always mm -hmm. as, a, as a continuation of wherefore. Matter of fact, Jill, read verse 11 for us. Sure. Revelation 12, verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. So when Jesus was victorious on the cross, when his blood was proven to be efficacious for the redemption of humanity, because they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, a line was drawn in the sand and Satan saw it. Mm -hmm. He knew this is it. We have just been given a pink slip, 
our vacation is imminent. We are about to be permanently evicted from anything that has to do with humanity. And the Bible says, therefore rejoice, O heavens. What a rejoicing it was when Jesus rose, when he was declared in Revelation 5, the lamb is worthy to be, to be praised because he was slain when the unfallen worlds began to declare there was a party. I say that reverently. There was a rejoicing par none that took place in all the unfallen vicinities of the unfallen worlds. Rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But then there was a pause, but woe yeah. to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea because the devil has come down unto you having great wrath mm. because he knows mm -hmm. he has a short time. He put on notice all of his imps, all of the, the veracity of the evil that could be unfolded. You see, I believe that this was the fulfilling of the third temptation of Jesus when he unveiled himself. The first and second, he hid himself. But in the third, he unveiled himself. And we're living in the day and age where Satan has unveiled himself. He's no longer hidden. Sins of the most, atro of the most atrocious in nature are being displayed before us, before our eyes, on the stores, on the internet, on television, in every kind of magazine you can think of. Things that will never be thought of as legal are now legal. Mm -hmm. Let me make it clear. Because it's legal doesn't make it right in the sight of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. We're living in that generation where Satan has taken off the blindfold and says, here I am, do this and do that. And he is pulling at every weakness in our character because he knows yeah. he has but a short time. But it's almost impossible to imagine the great controversy closing without the great controversy motif, which is encapsulated in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. We're going to look at that in, in little capsules. But what brings me joy about this is this lets us know that all the saints that are resting in their graves, waiting for the fulfillment of that great promise that Jesus will come again, their labor has not been in vain. Mm -hmm. right. Can you imagine what John would do if he was living in our day? How would Daniel feel when he saw, see his words coming to fulfillment with great 4K technical veracity? What would he say when he said, this is what I talked about? How would John feel today when he said, there is the beast participating, participating, participating as he said he would, there are the unclean spirits in the political circles, the religious circles, the financial circles, the moral circles, the social circles, mm. working their crafts because they all had been put on notice that their time is soon to come mm -hmm. to its end. You see, central to God's mission is the everlasting gospel. That's right. The writers of the lesson point, the message is in a real sense, the focus of the mission. The world needs to be warned about what is coming upon it and every person will be forced to make a choice either for or against eternal life. Mm -hmm. You see, without laboring with God to proclaim this message, we are laboring against God. For he says in his word in Luke 11, verse 23, he who is not with me right. is against me. You see the final message, all the neutral places are removed. There is no stands anymore. You're either on one team or the other, the That's stadium, right. all the walls are taken down. You are either for him or against him. There are no neutral places. And what a gospel that's proclaimed in the three angels messages. It forms the core, the heart of what we as Seventh-day Adventists believe is to be proclaimed to the entire world. And the central focus of it is two s simple themes, the everlasting gospel. Look at Revelation 14, verse 6, the everlasting gospel. The Bible says in Revelation 14, verse 6, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. What is the everlasting gospel? Revelation 13, verse 8, the lamb mm -hmm. slain from the foundation of the, of world. the world. Anybody, everybody, regardless of what you've done, can be redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Mm -hmm. That's good news. Jesus didn't send his son to condemn, only to condemn sin but to bring liberty and, and the freeing of the captives through the person of Christ Jesus. What is the focal point of that message? The two themes, one is the everlasting gospel. The second part of that theme is worship. Revelation 14, verse 12, worship the creator. 
Here it is. Here is the patience of the saints. Yeah. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You may not agree with the Ten Commandments, but then again, it doesn't call for agreement. <laughs> it calls for observation. It calls for the recognition that behind it is an authority that you cannot remove. And one day we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. What better time than now to get to know who that authority is and how we can live our lives in harmony with his declaration. So let's look at the proclamation. Revelation 14, verse 7, the proclamation that the judgment hour has come. Sing with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. Since 1844, the judgment hour message has been proclaimed. Since God continued the final phase of his ministration to proclaim liberty to the captives, something else has also come with that. It's a call back to true worship. Worship the creator, him who made heaven and the earth. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished and God rested, blessed and sanctified the seventh day. Mm -hmm. You may be a first day worshiper, but that's not God's original plan. God's plan is to recognize the day that continues to hold him up as creator and redeemer of humanity. Then we find Revelation 14, verse 8, another component, not only the judgment hour, not only a call back to worship, but a warning mm. that this false system set up by ancient Babylon is now imposing itself again in a spiritual context. In a symbolic way, Babylon is fallen. What is that message all about? All the false systems of worship are coalescing together and soon, right now, it's also already fallen in the eyes of God, but soon it's going to be, sorry, it's already, right, it's already fallen in the eyes of God, but soon it's going to be fallen in the eyes of man. Mm -hmm. Revelation 14, verse 8. And another angel follows saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Mm -hmm. One in the eyes of God, soon in the eyes of men. Mm -hmm. That great city under the leadership of the power of papal Rome, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. What is the wine? False doctrines, mm -hmm. false teachings, false representation of Jesus, a false message about the Sabbath, what happens when you die. So many other aspects of that, which I cannot cover now. But if you get the three angels messages in summary, which 3ABN is carrying, you. you'll get a chance. Call and ask the three angels messages in summary. That booklet will bring this message to, mm -hmm. to full fruition the warning against being a part of the system that is about to be fallen, never to rise again. Then the third warning, the warning about the beast and his image, his mark, his name, his number. Revelation 14, verse 9 and 10. Then the third angel followed, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength mm. into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. What a dire warning. Mm. Do you hear this message being proclaimed in your church? Mm -hmm. If not, come out of her, my people, Revelation, mm. Revelation 18, verse 4. God has not designed this message for just a particular group of individuals, mm -hmm. but for everyone who can be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The good news is somebody is going to celebrate the fulfillment of this message. Revelation 15, verse 2, and I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. The real question is not what's coming, but who's coming. And the eternal question is, where will you stand? Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank you Amen. so much, Pastor John. How do you do three angels' messages in 10 minutes? Wow. <laughs> We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our study on the end of God's mission. We're going to toss it over to Ryan Day. Amen. Thank you so much. During the break, we had to call the fire department because this seat to my right here was on fire. 
Pastor Loma King was, was preaching the gospel. Thank you so much, brother, for that. I'm going to try to keep up that energy. I'm Ryan Day. I have Tuesday's lesson entitled The Final Crisis. Mm -hmm. And my friends, if we don't recognize the times that we're living in and the importance of understanding the gospel for our time and for our lives, my goodness, then, then what are we doing? And the lesson brings out very clearly that we have this great commission. We've read it many times. I'm just going to reference it here, read it again. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. And so uh, the lesson brings out actually that this great commission that we just read in many ways is the three angels' messages. And of course, the three angels' messages is a present truth version of this commission. And I believe that with all my heart and soul because it says right there in Revelation 14, verse 6, the pastor has already brought out so clearly that this message is going to every tribe, every nation, every tongue, and every people here in the last days. And so my friends, we need to understand that. And I love the question that it asks here in the lesson. It says, what or why does every group of people matter to God? Mm -hmm. Why does every group of people? And I'm just going to read through a few verses here. The answer is very clear. God's word is just overwhelmingly clear on this. First John chapter four, verse eight. He who does not love does not know God for God is. Love. He loves us. God is love. He does everything is motivated by his love. Second Peter chapter three, verse nine. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but uh, in, is in excuse me, but is uh, long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's motivated by love. God is love. He loves us. And therefore people matter to him because he loves us. First Timothy chapter two and verse four, all desire, or excuse me, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge mm -hmm. of the truth. That is his goal. That is his plan, mm -hmm. his will. Genesis chapter 12 and verse three, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God wants to bless his people. Mm -hmm. He wants us all to be saved. The, the, the blood of the son of God was shed out of love so that each and every one of us might be in his kingdom. But we have to understand that down here in this final time that we're living in, prior to the second coming of Jesus, we are going to be living through a final crisis. And that final crisis happens to come down to two overt camps. Those who have submitted to the authority of Satan through the religious and political institutions as shown in Revelation 13 and 17. Mm. And those who have fully submitted to Jesus Christ, whose faith is made manifest by their keeping the commandments of God. In fact, we see it right there in the third angel's messages. I'm not going to go back over what pastor necessarily covered in that, but I just want to highlight the fact that if you look at the third angel's message, the Bible makes it very clear here that there are two camps of people that are presented right here. I'm just going to read through it here and we're going to highlight what those camps are and what and the difference between the two. Then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, this is Revelation 14 and beginning with verse 9. If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on their forehead or on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever and they shall have no rest day nor night who worships the beast. Notice that word keeps coming back up as pastor brought out this one of the elements of this last days uh, coupled with the everlasting gospel is the issue of worship. He who worships the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. That's the first camp. Mm -hmm. Those who reject God, those who reject his word, those who reject the everlasting gospel, they live for self. They're caught up in the deceptions of the enemy. They will not worship the creator, but will worship the beast. And then you have this second camp. We see there in verse 12, Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Mm -hmm. There are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I want to take the remaining time that I have to just break that down because we want to make sure that we find ourselves in that second group there of the third angel's message. That's right. We want to make sure that we find ourselves a part of the camp of God who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. But what is it exactly saying there? Let's break it down just a little bit so that we on a practical level understand God's will and God's plan for our life. Because at the end of the day, we find ourselves in one of these two camps, the sheep, the goats, the wheat, the tares, those who love truth, those who do not, those who serve and worship the creator and those who serve and worship the beast. 
the patience, excuse me, the, yes, the patience of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God. What are the commandments of God? What's the purpose behind the commandments of God? Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 40. Notice what Jesus says here. He reminds us the heart issue of it all. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. When we look at the law of God, when we look at the commandments of God, as we have stated in previous lessons, those first four commandments sum up our response and our relationship to God. Do we love him enough to make him the sole God of our lives? Do we love him enough to only worship him, to only honor him, to only bow and give him reverence? Do we love him enough to honor his character and his name and the holy, very holy nature of who he is as our God to not misrepresent his name and character? And do we love him enough to spend time with him, to worship him, to make him the sole creator of our life and to give our all to him in honoring the Sabbath and keeping it holy as a remembrance or as a recognition of his creative power and authority? Those first four commandments, as we, if we keep them, we are showing him that we love our creator with all our heart, mind, and soul. But then verse 39 and 40 of Matthew 20, uh, 22, says, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. Now we shift to the last six of the commandments, which is our relationship with our fellow man. Now, my friends, take what we just read and bring in now Romans chapter 13, because uh, we have these two camps of people in the last days. And it's interesting. Let's bring it kind of down here to modern times. It's interesting that the world, the secular world today is preaching self-love, love to others, no hate. It's this woke movement that we have to deal with. And it's interesting that their message is love, 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 no hate, no hate, no hate. But it's interesting how they might honor the idea or bring up the fact that we should love each other. But yet this secular, non-religious world that we're living in is rejecting the first four commandments and saying that they don't want anything with religion. They don't want anything with God. They deny God entirely. Mm. And that's not to say that they're not, you know, they're not violating the last six in some way. But notice the unbalanced nature of the secular world that we're living in. But then now you jump inside the religious platform, the religious world, and within the religious uh, uh, theater, you're seeing that people are, again, saying we should love God, we should worship God, and they're still not entirely keeping those commandments that are honoring God. But yet, even within the religious world, we're having trouble even within the church of people honoring and recognizing that they should love one another. Mm. There's an unbalance here. Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. What does it say? Oh, no one anything except to love one another. Mm -hmm. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not commit murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, Paul writes, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. If we're going to be a part of that camp of people that have the patience of the saints and keep the commandments of God, my friends, you have to have love because God is love. That is love for God and love for each other. But then it talks about having the faith of Jesus. What is the faith of Jesus? What did Jesus say in Matthew 26, his last words is before he would be t- taken captive or, or arrested and taken off to a cross? Mm-hmm. What did he say? Oh, Father, if it possible, yeah. if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will but as you will. Jesus often repeated this, Lord, not my will, your will. Even in John chapter four, verse 34, he says, my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. If we're going to have the will of God in our heart, then that is, of course, participating in that of the faith of Jesus. The faith of Christ is to do the will of him who sent him. That's right. Well, if you're really talking about the faith of Jesus, let this mind be in you, Mm. which is also in Christ Jesus who humbled himself, took up on flesh, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, a man who became the lowest of the lowest. But why? With what mindset? Philippians 2, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection of of mercy, fulfill my joy and be like-minded, having the same love, being of one, notice, being one accord, one accord of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. In this final crisis, if we're going to keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus and be among the saints that will inherit the kingdom, my friends, at the end of the day, we must have and adopt the mind of Christ. It all comes down 
this whole battle all comes down to a vindication of the character of Christ. And what is that character? It's love, love for God like no other, love for our neighbors as he has loved us. That's what it all comes down to. Which camp are you going to be in? Mm -hmm. In this final crisis, where are you going to find yourself? Worshiping the beast worship or worshiping the creator. Mm -hmm. You have a choice, each and every one of us do. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ryan. So I have Wednesday's lesson, Success in Mission. I'm James Rafferty. And the quarterly begins by asking the question, what is success in mission? We might be tempted to think that it is many baptisms, big churches, rapid growth rates. We might feel that success consists of entering every tribe and people group on planet Earth with the truth. And we can speed it up by using radio and internet and TV. While all of these can be good, we must remember that Paul wrote to the community of faith in Corinth, I planted, mm. Apollos watered, mm. but God gave the increase, 1 right. Corinthians 3, 6. In other words, our focus is to be on the process. God's focus will be on the growth. Amen. Now we've already seen, the quarterly goes on to say, that the object of God's mission is saving the lost in every people group on earth by making them loyal disciples of Jesus who are involved in mission. So then they give us a, a, a number of quotations, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, Isaiah 30, 21, John 10, verse 27, John 16, 12, and 13, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 11, Hebrews 3, 12, and 13, 1 John 1, 8, 1 John 1, 9, Revelation 7, 14, and Revelation 19, verse 8. And my fellow panelists are going to read all those verses for us real quick, and then we're going to summarize them. And the summary is... <laughs> Disciples of Jesus are pure. They remain loyal to Jesus as a pure bride would be betrothed to him. They follow Jesus as he leads them by the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. This includes leading us into missionary work for others. And there is no deception in these disciples. They are not led astray by, by doubt. Uh, they're not led astray by false teachings. They're not led astray by immorality. They do not feel morally superior to others. They recognize that they are imperfect, requiring God's cleansing grace and mercy. Understanding this, they are also open to receiving correction and instruction from other believers. Success in mission results in making these types of disciples. That's what success in ministry looks like according to the Bible. In fact, let's just focus on that last verse that was given there in the list of verses, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 8. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 8 comes in the context of, well, we'll read verse 7. Be, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him that is to God for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. This is a beautiful picture of the end game, so to speak. This is a beautiful picture of mission accomplished, the success in mission. And we see this picture in Revelation ch chapter 19, but we don't just see it there. We see it in previous verses. For example, in Revelation chapter 10, verse 7, it said that by the time the seventh angel sounds, which announces the second coming of Jesus, by the time the seventh angel sounds, the mystery of God should be finished. Mm -hmm. The context is, is that God is not waiting for a time prophecy. And I could add to that, God is not waiting for a time prophecy. He's not waiting for the Pope. He's not waiting for the Sunday law. He's not waiting for all of the signs to be fulfilled in Matthew chapter 24. God is waiting for us. Right. He's waiting for the bride to make herself ready. He's waiting for his people. When we are prepared, he will come. When the character of Christ is reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Why? Because then mission will be accomplished. And mission is Christ in us, the hope of glory. That's the mystery of God that's to be finished according to, first, to Colossians 1, 25 and 26. Christ in us. We are to represent Christ. We are to be, as it says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, clothed with the Son. Now, we're going to look at seven remnant 
realities of God's people, seven remnant realities. That is, in the book of Revelation, because that's the book that actually brings us to mission accomplished, we're going to see a picture of what mission accomplished looks like. And this mm -hmm. picture begins in Revelation chapter 12, because this is the second half of the book. The second half of the book is actually showing us what mission accomplished looks like in a people who have prepared themselves, according to Revelation 19 chapter 8 to receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So Revelation 12, 1 says that there's this woman who is clothed with the sun. She's standing on the moon. She has a crown of 12 stars on her head. Now in Malachi 4, verse 2, we're told that that sun is a symbol of Christ and his righteousness, the mm. sun of righteousness. So they're clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And this is really significant because in Revelation 12, 17, you have a people who keep the commandments of God. Mm -hmm. Th this people is identified in Revelation 12, 17 as the remnant of the seed of the woman. Mm -hmm. And it's only as we are the remnant of the seed of the woman that we can keep the commandments of God. Amen. In other words, the righteousness of Christ is gifted to us. His righteousness, meaning his right living, his right dying, everything that he accomplished for us as us, that is gifted to us. And when we receive Christ's righteousness, it's manifested in keeping the commandments of God. Amen. The commandments keeping doesn't save us. The commandment keeping isn't meritorious. The commandment keeping is what comes out of, is the fruit of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In fact, you can know if someone is trusting in Christ's righteousness because they keep the commandments of God. So in Revelation chapter 12, verse one, we have the first revelation of this remnant reality. In Revelation 12, verse 11, you have the second revelation of this remnant reality. In Revelation 12, verse 11, it says, and they, speaking of this same group, overcame him, speaking of the devil, who is in this context, verse 10, the accuser of the brethren who accuses before us before God day and night. They overcame him. They overcame his accusing, critical, judgmental mm. attitude, spirit, the spirit that naturally we have from the fall, they overcame that by the blood of the Lamb, by looking at Jesus, by His life, by His death, by focusing on Him. You see, when you come into problems in the church, when you come into problems in society, it's easy to get bitter and negative and critical. Keep your focus on Jesus. He never did that. Even those who crucified Him, Christ said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He kept His focus mm -hmm. on the mission, trying to reach souls. And usually when we end up in, 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 uh, in the context of persecution, intense persecution, usually that's an opportunity for the gospel to be preached more powerfully mm -hmm. than it can be preached in a time of peace. They overcome this critical negative by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto the death. Selfishness is gone from these people. There, there is no focus on self in this final group of people. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Mm -hmm. And then of course, Revelation 12, 17, we touched on that. It includes the testimony of Jesus, which we're told in Revelation 19, 10, is the spirit of prophecy. God's end time prophet given to this last day people to help them better understand the word of God, which is the foundation of their faith. Revelation 13, verse eight is our next remnant reality. It talks about a people who are written in the Lamb's book of life. I wish we had more time to talk about that, but then we have Revelation 14 and verse four. This next remnant reality, they follow Jesus wherever he goes. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. And then Revelation chapter 14, 12, uh, Ryan did a great job focusing on the principles in Revelation 14, 12. They keep the commandments of God. They keep the faith of Jesus. You can't keep something unless it's been given to you. God is giving us his commandments. He's promised to put them in our hearts. God is giving us the faith of Jesus. He's promised that we can have his faith and keep his commandments because they're gifted to us. We need to hold on to them. We need to hold on to what God gives to us. And then finally, Revelation 15, two through four, they sing the song of Moses mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the lamb. Mm -hmm. Now these seven remnant realities are mission accomplished. Why? Because the mission is to restore the image of God in a people on planet earth, even in the darkest of times. And that mission is going to be accomplished when Christ is formed in us, the hope of glory. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is the ultimate goal of the mission. To have him reproduced in us, to have God's character reproduced in us is the ultimate goal of the mission. Mm -hmm. And that's why when we look at these seven 
revelation realities, these seven remnant revelation realities, we find that God's people are going to be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. Amen. They're going to overcome by the blood of Jesus. They're going to have the testimony of Jesus. They're going to be written in the book of Jesus. They're going to be wherever followers of Jesus. They're going to keep the commandments and the faith of Jesus. They're going to sing the song of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's the whole focus. And the Antichrist wants to get us off that focus. Mm -hmm. He wants to put himself or ourselves in the place of mm, Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything that puts something or someone in the place of Jesus is part of the spirit of Antichrist. Right. And that That's spirit right. is all through our world. It's not just one particular person or institution. It is a spirit of Antichrist that w has been developing ever since the fall in Eden and has continued to develop till the end of time. And the only way we can be kept safe from that spirit is to keep our focus on Jesus. Amen. Amen. Love it. amen and amen. Thank you each and every one of you. What a rousing study this has been. My name is Shelley Quinn and I have Thursday's lesson, Mission Complete. This may have been mission success, mm -hmm. but it's not complete yet. Mm -hmm. At the end of time, God is going to stand up and exercise righteous judgment. He's mm -hmm. offered everything to all on earth. Either they've rejected or accepted him. And those who rejected him, God is going to destroy sin and suffering. And I'll tell you what, the final days of this on this earth, are going to be terrifying, are they not? Mm. But you know what? You may be sitting at home and thinking, I don't understand what the big deal is about being a Christian. I'm suffering. We all suffer. Mm. Jesus said, well, we're going to have tribulations in this world, but we've got someone to turn to and we have an inheritance that's stored up for us in heaven that will not, moth cannot destroy, nor rust can destroy. Mm. <clears throat> so, what happens? The Lord shows the apostle John what's going to happen after he destroys the earth and the, he gives him the vision of mission fulfilled. God is going to recreate the earth and, and he's going to restore his paradise on earth. Mm. We begin the Bible, Genesis, the Garden of Eden, paradise lost. We end the Bible in Revelation, and we see paradise restored. God is going to have a new Genesis mm -hmm. for those who have He has recreated in His image. So let's look at Revelation 21, 1 through 4. Woo! These, these are exciting texts. Amen. John now sees God is casting the vision of mission fulfilled. Revelation 21. Verse one, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The new earth is going to be command central for God. He, this will be the Lord's headquarters. Verse three, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Finally, mm -hmm. the desire of our up close and personal God's heart who has always wanted to dwell with his people, it will finally happen. He will dwell in the midst of his covenant people and the new earth is going to be populated with people from every ethnic group. Verse four, here's what I'm looking forward to. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. Why not? Death and sin will be gone. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Mm -hmm. Satan and wickedness are destroyed. Now we're to read Revelation 21, beginning in verse 22. We'll see if we've got time for this. Verse 22 of Revelation 21. 
John is seeing what God is going to do in the end. And he's seeing the new Jerusalem coming down. And then he says, but I saw no temple in it for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Mm -hmm. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, and there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall, listen here, there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, mm -hmm. but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Have you entered into covenant relationship with God? Are you in the Lamb's book of life? If you are, you can have assurance of salvation if you know that you believe what he's, Jesus is the Son of God and you follow him. Revelation 22 and verse 1 and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healings of the nation. And there shall be no more curse, yeah. but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. Mm -hmm. Now get this, Revelation 22, verse 4, my favorite. They shall see his face mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and his name shall be on their foreheads. Oh, what a day that's yeah. going to be when we see him face to face. Yeah. You know, a lot of people say, Oh boy, I can't wait for that getting up morning, the resurrection morning. And I can't wait to see my mama or mm -hmm. my husband or my baby or somebody that they've lost. Mm -hmm. And you know what I say? You know what? I know we're going to be excited to see him eventually, but I kind of imagine on that day, our attention's going to be so fully turned to seeing the glory of him who saved us. That'll be secondary. Mm. So it says, there shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun for the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. You know what? You are going to have a dwelling place in the holy city because that's what Jesus promised us. Mm -hmm. He said in John 14 too, in my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if it were not so, I would have told you, but mm -hmm. you're also going to have a country home. We go in and out of the new Jerusalem. Isaiah 65, 21 says, we're going to build houses and plant vineyards. Life in the new earth is going to be like Adam and Eve's life in the Garden of Eden. It will be idyllic. They lived in a paradise. Actually, Eden means pleasure. God created a garden of pleasure for them before the entrance of sin. And when he destroys sin, we're going to have it again. Amen. And then Isaiah 65, 25 says, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. God created the animals to be mm -hmm. vegetarians mm. and he's going to restore them to be vegetarians. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and so no creature, Isaiah says, will hurt or destroy mm -hmm. another because we're all going to be vegetarians again. And let me tell you something, eternity is not going to be spent 
floating around on a cloud, strumming a harp. Daniel 7, 27 says the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. All dominions shall serve and obey him. The redeemed are going to rule with the Lord throughout eternity. No wonder. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, I has not seen nor ear heard Amen. nor has entered into the heart of the man those things which God has prepared yeah. for those who love him. Amen. We must do his work to hasten his return. We must reach the unreached people. A reached people group are those who have... Uh, adequate numbers and resources that they don't need outside help to spread the word, but we've got to reach the unreached. Right. And what we need to do is take these challenges seriously. At the end of each week's lesson, have you written your disciples' names down? Hey, if you've been praying for them all quarter, it is time for you to step up and take the challenge to bring them now into a fellowship. Amen. Yeah. Thank, yeah. You Thank you so much, Shelley. Mission restored. I love that. Thank you, Shelley, Pastor mm -hmm. James, Ryan, and Pastor John mm -hmm. for your insight and share some final thoughts. Well, Revelation 17, 17, if you think that all that is going to happen is under the control of man, here is the final verse that I give to you. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. Ultimately, God is in charge. Amen. First John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Amen. Amen. The book of Revelation tells us how we can escape the deception of Antichrist, and that is by keeping our eyes on Jesus Christ. Amen. The quarterly says, now is the time to invest in God's mission of making disciples and all people groups, hastening our Savior's return. And in the end, we'll live with them in heaven. Amen. What an incredible study this has been. Thank you all. Thank you for joining us. It all comes down to this. God is love. That's right. He loves you. He loves this world. He wants to bring us back to that complete and restored relationship with him. Join us next week. We start a brand new quarter. That's right. This is first quarter 2024. We're going to be studying the book of Psalms. We're going to get through all 150 of them, I guess, wow. in 13 weeks. So make sure you join us next quarter on 3ABN.